Now that we've established a good historical basis as to the idea behind gene expression, the idea behind DNA directing the synthesis of proteins through that one gene, one protein, or one polypeptide hypothesis, we can continue our introduction by entitling this next flowchart Introduction 2. And more specifically, in Introduction 2, we're going to be going in depth in terms of the molecular biology behind gene expression. So first and foremost, we want to understand something called the flow of genetic information. So we know from our overarching definition that DNA directs the synthesis of proteins, and there's going to be a flow of genetic information associated with that direction of synthesis. Let's look at it. The flow of genetic information is most often referred to as the central dogma of biology. Central dogma of biology. This is a huge concept, a very important concept, that was first established by Francis Crick in 1956. So remember Watson and Crick and their structure of DNA? Well, they actually, Crick specifically, was able to figure out that through the structure of DNA, you get even more information. You actually, you actually are able to figure out that there's a flow of genetic information due to the beautiful structure that DNA possesses. He specifically was able to figure out the following, that there is what is known as a unidirectional, meaning one direction, not the boy band, but a one direction flow of genetic info. So again, there are going to be a lot of interchanging terms throughout this lecture. Genome, genotype, genetic info, DNA, genes, all those things are the same, but just different forms of saying it, okay? Don't get tripped up by that. There's a unidirectional flow of genetic information. I think the best way to understand this is one of the simplest concepts in all of biology, but one of the most overarching themes, one of the most powerful ideas is that DNA will turn into RNA, and you guys have probably seen this before in your high school classes or any bio class, and that RNA will eventually turn into protein. And where have we seen this before? We've actually seen this idea of going backwards to RNA in the origin of life. Remember the RNA world hypothesis? I won't diverge on that topic. I believe that we have a good understanding of it, but it's important to understand that this is the central dogma of biology right down here, the unidirectional flow of genetic information. But now more specifically, I want to put some names to these arrows. And on top of this first arrow, you can actually squeeze in the following. The flow of genetic information is first dictated by something called transcription. Gene expression is all about transcription and translation. And we'll do translation right over here. So translation and transcription. Transcription comes first. So over here you can actually put TXN if you want. And over here you can put TSN. This is what I'll be abbreviating translation and transcription respectively. So transcription, which we will call TXN from this point forward, is the following. It's the simple statement of when we go from info from, oops, from DNA, so information, genetic information, let's say, is used to synthesize RNA. Very simply speaking, DNA turns into RNA via transcription. We're going to explain that in much more detail. Oops, I actually spelled this wrong. There's supposed to be an S here, so I'm just going to squeeze that in. Just, there's much more than just the simple definition right here, but it's a good overall idea that we can get that info from DNA is used to synthesize RNA as stated by this unidirectional first part of flow. Translation, which we'll abbreviate as TSN, is going to be defined as the following. Ribosomes, which we know as are the protein producing factories of cells, ribosomes use info from info from you guessed it right over here, mRNA specifically. We'll explain what mRNA is in just a second to synthesize polypeps. Polypeps are polypeptides, and thus they are proteins. And I think the most important thing to understand from all of this, um, right over here, underneath both transcription and translation, and even this right over here, you can sort of extend this knowledge, this whole central dogma, is the following. This occurs in 
all organisms. That is a very humbling thing to think about, in my opinion. From the simplest of organisms, like a unicellular prokaryote, to the most complex of humans that are eukaryotic, every single living organism that we know of undergoes this central dogma, that's a central belief of biology, known as transcription and translation, thus gene expression. So this occurs in all organisms. That's a really amazing thing to think about, at least in my opinion. You may not think so, but that's all right. And we'll finally finish off our introduction by stating uh, the following. So now this is really our first time ever mentioning RNA besides the RNA world hypothesis. I think now it's a good time to really figure out what RNA is. So RNA is simply a nucleic acid, okay, from our biological molecules lecture. It's a nucleic acid, but specifically, I think it's a good idea to figure out what RNA is by comparing it to its cousin, its DNA cousin. So let's look at DNA, and then we're also going to be looking at RNA, and we'll split them apart like this, and we'll look at a couple of features of both. The first feature that we'll look at is the sugar. So remember, the nucleic acid has a sugar, it has phosphate, it has a nitrogenous base, all of those things. So let's look at each of them. So the sugar in DNA is a deoxyribose. So we're going to write that down, deoxyribose. That's why it's called DNA. It's deoxyribose. What do you think RNA is? RNA is simply a ribose sugar. That's a five-carbon sugar. So we have the sugar covered. What about the bases, the nitrogenous bases seen in DNA? are the following. They are A, G, which are the purines, and also C and T, which are the pyrimidines. And then we have in RNA a bit of a difference in the sense that we still have A and G, okay, and we still have C, but now we have a new guy known as uracil, U. So T and U sort of switch up and get replaced by something else. It actually looks like an I, so I'm going to erase that, put it down here. So the T and the U is our major difference in the nitrogenous bases. And also, there's a major difference in terms of strandedness. DNA is double-stranded, so we're going to label it DS, and we're going to label RNA, of course, as single-stranded, SS. So, um, some basic details behind this comparison that are important to understand. It's important to understand what ribose really is, because I just said ribose is a sugar. I think it's important to understand why it's not deoxyribose. The reason why is because there is indeed a hydroxyl group, an OH group, dash OH means hydroxyl group, at the 2' prime carbon, and this is actually not seen in DNA. That's why DNA is called deoxy. Deoxy meaning there's no oxy, there's no hydroxyl group at this 2' prime carbon for DNA. That's why it's called deoxy, whereas ribose, you don't need to say deoxy, you just can say ribose. It's a normal ribose sugar at um, its nucleotide structure. In addition, I think it's important to understand what U is. U stands for uracil. So we're no longer focusing on thymine, but we're focusing on uracil. Uracil, just like um, cytosine, is a, is a pyrimidine. Excuse me, it is a pyrimidine. So we're going to write that down. Uracil is a pyrimidine. What else is a pyrimidine? Of course, C is a pyrimidine as well. So uracil is a, pr a pyrimidine. It actually replaces T in this sense. And because it replaces T, it actually has a bit of a difference in the sense that it actually lacks a methyl group, lacks CH3, um, that is seen on T but not seen on U. That's why it's called uracil. Okay? That's why there's a difference. The simple lack of this methyl group will dictate a uracil instead of a thymine. You should look at a figure in your textbook to just sort of emphasize that. And finally, because it replaces T, it actually also complements whatever T would complement. And it complements, meaning that it pairs up with A via two H bonds, just like T does. So U and A combined via two H bonds, um, A and T combined via two H bonds. It's just this lack of CH3 group that defines uracil. And finally, we can conclude this video on looking at the types of RNA based off of this background knowledge. So the types of RNA that we'll be going over uh, today are, most importantly, I think, um, mRNA. We're also going to be looking at rRNA, 
very briefly, I think, and also tRNA, which is very critical in gene expression. So what is mRNA? mRNA is going to simply be three words I want you to know about mRNA is that it en encodes, this is a key word, encodes entire protein. Okay, so remember, DNA provides a blueprint to make RNA, as stated by this, through the transcription process, and that will eventually encode an entire protein. Our RNA, which is otherwise known as ribosomal RNA, this is messenger RNA, that's why it's mRNA and rRNA, respectively. Ribosomal RNA is a structural component of what structure in the cell do you think? If it's called ribosomal RNA, of course it is a structural component of ribosomes. It is basically the, the, the bricks and mortar of uh, ribosome structure, okay? Structural component of ribosomes. That's why it's called ribosomal RNA. And tRNA, which is transfer RNA, is going to be the final type of RNA you should understand. This is going to be uh, the RNA that carries individual amino acids, and that's amazing, which we'll get to that in just a second, don't worry, carries individual amino acids to ribosome during TSN, meaning during translation, okay, TSN. So I just want to make this clear. This will be abbreviated as TXN from this point forward, and this will be abbreviated as TSN. You probably won't see translation as TSN. I can't figure out the official abbreviation, so I just made one up, TSN, and transcription. You will often see it as TXN. That is a very important abbreviation many biologists use. So overall, we've completed our introduction. Lots of information, yes, I know, but we have a historical basis. We know that the genotype dictates dictates the phenotype based off of the experiments given by Gerard and also the experiments given by Beetle and Tatum. Gerard looked at those enzymatic loss of function in humans and Beetle and Tatum looked at the bread mold and mutations and seeing that there's problems with minimal media once mutations are introduced. Well, of course there are going to be problems. Well, of course there are going to be issues because the flow of genetic information was disrupted. The DNA was disrupted, thus the RNA was disrupted, thus the protein was disrupted, thus we have a loss of gene expression or a, la or a let's say, problem with gene expression. We have transcription and translation, two key components to figuring out what gene expression really is. And gene expression um, sort of centers itself around this middleman known as RNA. RNA has these differences between DNA, and overall those differences are mainly due to structural components, and thus we have structural differences that lead to functional differences between DNA and RNA, and the functional differences can be denoted further by looking at the types of RNA known as mRNA, rRNA, and tRNA.